All right. So let us resume. And the second talk is giving by Tomasz Prozen from uh, University of Ljubljana, uh, who will speak about integrable deterministic dynamics with non abelian symmetries from KPZ mean transport of neuter charges to their anomalous fluctuations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving the opportunity and inviting uh, for this very nice workshop. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's uh, uh, my maybe third or fourth time. Also, I would like to make a disclaimer that my talk now is completely different than my talk tomorrow. So there's zero, uh, we feel like. Uh, <clears throat> also, I should apologize before I continue for the long title. I normally don't like long titles. This time I kind of try to describe the essence of my talk already in the title. So there are basically three things I want to discuss. Uh, uh, which are kind of, well, almost independent, but still very closely connected as well. So um, there has been this uh, observation of KPZ, uh, KPZ universality in quantum pin chains at equilibrium, which is kind of looks very different than what people normally would consider as KPZ. Uh, I mean, which is manifestly far from equilibrium uh, 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 physics. So uh, this is still kind of calling for, for a proper uh, interpretation. So I'll try to just uh, open, for those who have not seen this, I will try to open the problem, discuss observations. Basically, we have, at least I have no clue how to explain those obs observations. So it's an interesting, I believe an interesting problem. So the idea is to, okay, I will try to go into that. I will present some numerics, some uh, uh, numerics on quantum spin chains and on classical spin chains. Uh, I like to stress right away that it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, even though some people still think that this, this is like observation of KPZ in quantum physics, but the main thing is really to understand some very subtle behavior of integrable systems with non-abelian symmetry. So we have, to, non abelian symmetries and uh, due to them you have conservation law for nether charges so you look at transport of nether charges like spin and you want to understand the uh, the behavior of <clears throat> of of let's say two point functions of the spin spin uh, let's say spin spin current um, and uh, you will observe that this is excellently described by by two point functions of pc it is not clear what happens to fluctuations miss and this has been already addressed in experiments, as you will see uh, by Emmanuel Bloch, for example. So I try to make here a point that a fluctuation seems to be anomalous and seems to be not described by what people believe be uh, fluctuations in KPZ. And I will close my talk with a solvable model, which is not answering the previous questions, it's answering one question about fluctuations and their anomaly in deterministic interacting systems. Uh, and again, I try to, 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 to discuss, I mean, I try to kind of stress here that this is some context that people have not so much looked into, namely fluctuations in deterministic systems. I mean, usually people think of stochastic dynamics, Markovian dynamics, then things seems to be simpler and more kind of diffusive or normal. Uh, but here things that there are, seems that there are some, some somehow interesting and quite generic features uh, which have to do with anomalous scaling of fluctuations. So what I mean by anomalous scaling of fluctuations in short is lack of scaled cumulants in full counting statistics. And please feel free to stop me and ask questions at any point. So I will now start with some observations which essentially started with this paper of ours in 2017, but I will stress there were papers before that, but this was kind of really to the point. So for example, we looked here into uh, Spin transport in Heisenberg model. Uh, I'm not even writing the Hamiltonian. Everybody knows the Heisenberg spin chain. Spin on, I mean Heisenberg spin on half chain, which has SU two symmetry. Then you look at uh, well. He, this was actually these are two 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 plots. One is for the isotropic Heisenberg. The other is for the easing or easy axis Heisenberg. That is for isotropy larger than one. For the if you want for the gap Heisenberg spin chain. And this is just, I mean, this is sort of in that time was more or less kind of state of the art DMRG simulation of spin spin correlations. This is rather, we were kind of 
quite brave to go to such long times because it's very difficult to argue that DMR is still uh, accurate enough. So other people after us actually kind of were much more careful and tried to reconfirm these results successfully. But this was like, you see, the rather long times, like 160 time steps. Well, this is in some units of one over J, if you want. So you see that this is uh, this is spin-spin correlation function, and this is current-current correlation function, and this dashed green line, two thirds. So it's a uh, it's this anomalous parabola, uh, which suggests that the spin transport is not uh, diffusive. Here it's uh, normal parabola t square or x square t uh, sorry, x is t square. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can look at this. I mean, the the state. The important thing is. This is infinite temperature protocol, and the initial state is slightly biased state with respect to monetization. So you take, you take uh, uh, half infinite chain with uh, respect to monetization parameter mu, and the right infinite, semi-infinite chain with respect to minus mu. So the net monetization is zero, but there is a bias. And then, uh, for, for, and, and what we consider is the parameter of bias, which is small. I mean, that's important. This is not uh, a domain wall initial state. This is like, a, uh, I mean, it is, some people call it domain wall, but it is a partial domain wall or a very weak domain wall initial state. So it's close to infinite temperature. And then you look at uh, the, the, the flow. I mean, this is actually correlation function in equilibrium, not to be uh, mistaken, but uh, this can be connected, of course, in the linear response. When you take mu to zero limit, then a correlation function is in equilibrium can be connected to uh, currents and monetizations in this non-equilibrium state. And then what you see, uh, for example, if you integrate the current through the section between two halves, uh, then this current uh, integrated goes through, it, through the cut, uh, grows with its exponent alpha. And this alpha, you can think of it as dynamic exponent one over Z. And then you see that for delta equal to one for isotropic spin chain, this goes very close to two thirds. It converges. This is a uh, moving uh, time dependent uh, dynamical exponent if you want, and it goes to two thirds. And in the iso uh, Ising uh, type chain with that for delta larger than one, it goes to one half. Yeah. And then it suggests a phase diagram that the infinite temperature anisotropic Heisenberg chain is ballistic. It's been discussed in previous works and I'm not going to that. Ballistic for the X uh, or gapless uh, regime uh, diffusive for the easing type uh, easy, easy axis regime and super diffusive with two thirds or three or two exponents in the isotropic point. This was 2017. And then actually, I want to stress again, I mean, I don't want to show this old numerics, but I want to stress that Marcos Niederich observed consistent numerics using boundary driven steady state Limblatt equation for the XXX model in 2011. And he observed. Uh, scaling of the steady state currents, which is consistent with dynamical exponent three or two, already in 2011. And then there was our paper with uh, my graduate student at that time, Bojan Junkovic, uh, again, around the same time later, where we look at the landau lishitz model, classical landau lishitz model. Again, we observed dynamical exponent, which was like two thirds, 0 0.65. We didn't pay much attention to that value then. We didn't know what to expect. At least, I mean, we claim that this is anomalous, but uh, I mean, just to say that there are some old data suggesting very similar physics. But then the really interesting, I think, observation was in this paper where we have looked at really two point function more carefully. I mean, in this Nature of Com paper, uh, 2017, we basically did not have enough uh, accuracy to distinguish Gaussian. This would like, if you take a cross section of two point function, you expect some Gaussian like profile, you see something Gaussian like. And you don't know really whether it's Gaussian or not. You need more accuracy. And then uh, using some tricks in 2019, in particular doing completely different time protocol, meaning looking at really six vertex model for unitary uh, uh, dynamics instead of trotterizing Heisenberg. I mean, trotterizing means you have to do the trotter limit, which means you have to do much more work. But if you do finite time steps, still has integrability, still has SU2 symmetry, you can do much more, you can do much longer time. And you see, you see, you have much more accurate data here than there. But in both cases, the two point function is not Gaussian, this thin line, but is what people would expect for uh, two point functions of KPZ, uh, which is this Prachofer-Spohn 
uh, <clears throat> function, I mean, data, which was tabulated by Prachofer and Spohn, uh, which we used to compare to our data. This is real time, this is all real time. Everything I'm doing is real time. So the, 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 unit, the evolution is really unitary, but it's finite step. It's finite time step. So it's really a circuit. Here it's a circuit, here it's totalization doing DMRG. In both cases, you see that you get excellent agreement with two point functions of QPC. <clears throat> Okay, now this is some observations. Again, completely, this is like writing a dictionary. We don't know what it, uh, why it works, but if you write a dictionary, you compare two point functions of KPZ, what we observe, you see that you have to identify the gradient of the height field with the sigma Z. If you do that, then you get one-to-one -one correspondence. And on, on top of that, since we do linear response simulations, sorry, this is the wrong, uh, wrong limit. This is limit mu equal to zero, not mu to infinity. So mu is this, uh, a bias parameter. If you take but if limit of bias parameter going to zero, then this uh, this is like a Kubo formula, right? This is like a well, it's a linear response formula. This is like a, a, a one point function in equilibrium is associated to two point functions. Sorry, out of equilibrium is with two point functions in equilibrium at infinite temperature. Now, then you basically associate, I mean, that this is how we kind of made these two uh, uh, comparisons, but these two comparisons are either for a uh, gradient of the, of the sigma Z uh, or uh, density of the spin current. Yeah, and density of the spin current is now, the one is kind of identified with the function F, which is the second derivative of the KPZ correlation function. And the other is identified with the function H, which I have to apologize is not height field, it's just the same symbol, but since in the paper we did not use height field, so it doesn't overlap. But here in this slide, it unfortunately overlaps. But this height is just related again to the to the correlation function g, which is g is is basically g of phi minus phi times g prime. So in f is g. So that did this connection between those these two profiles, profiles of the of the of the of the sigma z and of the spin current. Uh, this connection is basically just a continuity equation. I mean, there is the fact that these two profiles have to be connected following from continuity equation. I mean, that you can learn from continuity, but of course, why you should have this identification of, of these profiles with the KPZ uh, uh, scaling of the KPZ correlation function is not clear. I mean, it's, uh, it's just an observation. <clears throat> okay, now let me move on. I mean, there has been papers or quite a, many papers afterwards. And actually there are still papers actually just this morning, there was a interesting paper by Herbert Spohn and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and colleagues in Bangalore. Uh, again, the very same problem uh, on the problem of integrability breaking and observing KPZ, but I didn't include it yet in my slides, but uh, it's just a very incomplete list of papers which appeared after our observations. And I would stress in particular, I would want to point out a couple of papers. For example, Virbal Kandani uh, has tried to develop some sort of intuitive understanding of the derivation of KPZ, which yeah, is not by far, me, by, by no means rigorous, but it, it gives you some picture. And then there was actually, I mean, I think another two papers which need to be stressed are these two papers by Strank and Vassur, and uh, later on uh, by Leoski, Jacopo, Strank. Romain and Braden. Uh, the, the point of these papers was that they really explained why dynamic exponent three over two should appear in these models. And there is a self-consistent, uh, I don't know, but I, I mean, I think this is not a rigorous proof, but <clears throat> the GHD, but anyway, it's a nice self-consistent argument uh, that shows that uh, 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 the dynamic exponent should be three over two, not only in SU2 symmetric models, but in models with arbitrary non-abelian symmetries. So there is this notion, which I will also come to in the next slide, which we like to uh, provocatively call super universality of super diffusion. The term super universality means that it applies irrespective of the non-abelian uh, Lie group symmetry of the model. So the model should have some global Lie group symmetry, but the, the effect, the dynamic exponent does not really depend on the Lie group symmetry. Uh, actually in this last, no, there is another paper actually by, by, uh, yeah, by a group from US, uh, also from early this week, I think, uh, where they again provide extra, this was by Norman Yao and company, 
I also did not include it yet in my slides, but they provided extra uh, evidence for, from DMRG on quantum spin chains with SU3 and SU2 bar one supersymmetry and so on. So it seems that you can afford any kind of non-abelian uh, global symmetry and you still should expect the same sort of three over two dynamic exponents. So this is really kind of puzzling, yeah? Uh, of, of course, I mean, but it's nice to, to have these two papers because at least you understand this quasi-particle picture. And from the fact, from these kinematics of the so-called giant quasi-particles, it, it seems that the only consistent dynamical exponent that you can expect is three over two. Okay, and then as I already announced, there are experiments. Uh, there are in particular two experiments which seem to this sort of physics. There is experiment by a group of uh, Emmanuel Bloch, Johannes Zeiger, uh, which I think is still in the form of preprint, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go into the experiment. I'm not really uh, competent to, to discuss experiment, but it's very nice, I mean, to see this kind of, uh, I mean, here they have basically it's a quasi 1D uh, uh, arrangement so they, had, they can uh, tune coupling to the uh, uh, to in the second dimension so they can go basically smoothly from one to 2D and they find that the dynamic exponent goes from, from 3 over 2 to, to, to 2 for example where 2 is diffusion. Now there is even better let's say better in the sense of uh, true experiment right? using neutron scattering in the group by Alan Tennant in Oak Ridge uh, where they sort of very carefully look at the scaling of dynamical structure factors, uh, namely the scaling uh, Q. And, uh, they find, uh, they compare nuclear scattering data with M DMRG, with MPS simulations, and uh, dynamic exponent three over two should be consistent with the fall off, fall off of dynamic structure factor with Q, but also exponent three over two, which is 1.5. So what they find is really power, which is sometimes sometimes something between 1.3 to 1.5, 1.6. Of course, you see this is very very difficult experiment. It's very hard to, uh, but you know it's consistent at least with with claims. And these are you know these are kind of temperatures which are close to let's say room temperature, right? It's not very good. Okay, um, all right. So now let me go to our. Uh, so basically the. Now, this was sort of the introduction or the motivation. Why should we kind of excited about this? go to people? Because I know this is kind of more mathematical physics workshop. Uh, people are also excited about numerics and experiments are more excited about cute mathematical models. I mean, I could totally share this point of view. So let me just now discuss a couple of cute mathematical models, which can be partly solved and uh, which contain this sort of physics. So now uh, first kind of, third of my, or the rest of my talk will be these models, which we, um, which can kind of are natural generalization of lattice landau lishitz models. So these are models which are discrete in space, discrete in time, and the, in the continuum limit, they reduce to landau lishitz magnets, in particular when the symmetry is SU2. So these are like SUN magnets, if you want, but the symmetry doesn't need to be SUN. I mean, it can be, USPN, if you want, USP2N. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, as you will see, the, the models are kind of very abstract and very general. And it turns out that for any kind of uh, specification of the symmetry group, uh, the, 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 the exponent seems to be three over two and the, uh, the, the, the two point function seems to be KPC. So, and they're classical models. So you can simulate very easily. So why on this is because I can now show you these models are integrable. I can provide very simple integrability structure, for example, Lux, uh, Lux matrices and uh, transfer matrices, uh, conserved charges, and all that. We cannot compute correlation functions. As you know, that even integrable systems, the, the very fact that you have integrability structure does not give you correlation functions. So uh, there is still this big gap, compute correlation functions. Hope that one day some smart physicists will come and uh, uh, do, the, do the step. But you know, at this point, we just say, okay, now there are these models which are kind of very general and very cute for which we can completely disclose integrability structure. They are discrete in space, discrete in time. They have some nice symmetries also between space and time, but uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot really go further. We numerically. So what are these models? These models are given by, these are models are like, I mean, again, they are like cellular automata. So they are defined on extended space-time lattice. 
So there are dynamical systems, which are discrete in time. There are many body dynamical systems and they are completely specified by the two, two spin map or two matrix map. So now the degree of freedom of the, of the dynamics is a matrix and by N matrix. Uh, and these maps are given by uh, a map map, a pair of matrices to pair of matrices. Yeah? And these are very simple maps, which are rational functions in space of matrices. And I will tell you later that they are closed in some manifolds of matrices, which share some interesting symmetries. But let me just first, you know, just defining the map. It's a rational function of two maps. Is it M1 prime, M2 prime? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The primes. Right, exactly. So you see, basically what you do is you do the conjugation with the sum of matrices plus I tau and the swap. So you exchange and the conjugation. It's a composition of exchange and conjugation, okay? Right, so only this map has very interesting property. Well, I don't know if you find it interesting, it's kind of obvious that it has this property, but still, I mean, first of all, the, this is not, so you would be the map. This architecture as a, time, as a time step. See, plays the role of the time step in the trotter limit. But this map does not have the point, the, 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 the semi-group property, but it has this, this inversion property that the inverse of the map is the map with argument minus tau. And this map conserves, this maps conserves, uh, 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 it is closed in the subset of matrices which square to one, which are essentially like projectors. I mean, you can write these matrices as, uh, <clears throat> as, 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 as uh, two times projector minus one, and then they square to one. <laughs> So uh, if matrix is square to one, this image is square to one and they preserve hermeticity. And moreover, they preserve this, uh, if you want, SUN spin. So the sum of matrices is preserved at the time evolution. Now, okay, so let me now define really what I mean by the phase space of the dynamics. So it turns out that the phase space now, is, as you see, I mean, this preserves projectors, the phase space projectors of rank K, which are known as complex Grassmannians. So you take N by N matrices, Hermitian n by n matrices, which uh, have rank k. Well, now in this, here I will, I mean, as I say, I mean, I will use a uh, not projector, but you can always think of identifying this m with the projector, like this is two times p minus one. Uh, so this projector has rank k, or this matrices has k eigenvalues, which are minus one, and n minus k values, eigenvalues, which are plus one. So we call this uh, diagonal matrix a signature. And then this matrix can be uniquely, or not uniquely, but it can be parameterized by a unitary, by a special unitary matrix times the signature, I mean, by, by, you know, it's similar to this signature matrix, okay? Uh, <clears throat> right. <clears throat> okay, so now this is a uh, phase space. This is a phase space for a single matrix. So now this is generalizing a sphere, right? For uh, matrices of rank uh, one, uh, two by two matrices of rank one, this complex Grassmannian is just a sphere, is S2, right? But now this is a general sphere to dimension N and rank K. In, uh, N2 and K equal to one, this is two dimensional sphere, right? Otherwise this dimension is always even and it has this dimensionality. Okay, now, so let's see how we now, now this would be like a single, single particle phase space. Now we take a direct product, Cartesian product of N copies of these uh, Grassmannian spheres. We define dynamics as an embody uh, interacting, nearest neighbor interacting dynamics in discrete space time. And this is defined as a cellular automaton, as a kind of cellular automaton with continuous variables. So the, you place the map, uh, which has this brickwork structure. So you have a, a string of even number of matrices, let's say with periodic boundary conditions, and then you make first even steps, odd steps, even steps, odd steps, and so on. So you make this type of space time dynamics, you, if you want, you can define the man, uh, dependence on space uh, L and time T of these matrices, and then you, you write it like this. Yeah? This would be like equivalent writing. It's like a discrete uh, partial difference equation uh, defining this sort of dynamics. It's nonlinear though. <clears throat> so, do you mean parameter tau? Uh, it's important that tau is global. Yes, it is the same for all the pairs. Otherwise, dynamics would not be integrable. You could think of placing a impurity, but this will break integrability. So, only where? Uh, 
Yes. It is something like that, yes. So let's see, let's see. Yeah. No, I'm mean, maybe send you. It is related to the spectral parameter, yes. Yes. But the way if you have the global in integral. So let, let me just to you how then you will maybe see what uh, you want. So now let me just try to define this dynamics now in terms of zero curvature. This zero curvature transport condition for the lux operators, right? So you define two lux operators, one propagate diagonally this way, which we call L plus, and the other propagate diagonally that way, which we call L minus. So we have two directions. You have this a joint linear problem now. So you, you basically now, you see, uh, going back to this, I know I skipped one point, but it doesn't matter so much. So now you have the lattice where the physical variables lives, live on sides of the lattice. Now you assign some auxiliary variables on the vertices of the lattice. And so then you define lux operators which propagate these variables uh, vertices. And of course, I mean, this maybe I can even skip. I mean, you define the full many body map through the tensoring, if you want, of two body maps. So these are two body maps, phi of tau, and then you define the whole column, uh, whole column of odd and even layer in time. And then the composition of the two is the full many body map. Yeah, so this would be just a map which acts on the full many body space M, the pen tensor L. Okay, so now just to see how uh, this can be understood as the discrete zero curvature condition, if you want, or parallel transport condition. So what you want is basically that L minus L plus using these variables is the same as L plus L minus using image variables, right? Then on top of that, you can still afford a twist, something which can be connected to a magnetic field. I mean, in SU2, it's just a magnetic field. In SUN, it's kind of an SUN magnetic field or a twist if you want, but can we still put on top of that? So our dynamics using the twist field can be, can be written like this, right? So this was exactly as I wrote before, but also using this F. Now, for the rest of my talk, I will mainly assume that this twist is identity, but you know it can be done slightly more generally. Okay, so now you see this is just the zero curvature condition, and these are the ha, and forgot to say this minimal set of assumptions. So it's a kind of a minimal model with non-abelian, with with these non-abelian symmetries, which is integrable, which minimal in the sense that uh, the pa symmetric parallel transport parallel transport is symmetric. So this lux operator is exactly this. That lux operator is linear. It's linear in spectral variable and it's linear in dynamical variable. And this nonlinearity constraint, dynamical variable squares to one. And using this assumption, this is unique. Yeah. Sorry? Right. Yeah, I don't know what you mean, but uh, yeah, I should. Yeah, you can always think of this as well. Uh, that's a good point, yeah. Uh, we actually didn't do much with this twist, so we didn't discuss it uh, much, but uh, we can discuss it at any point, yeah. But for the time just of being, just forget it because, it's, but yeah, you can always bring it in and then we can discuss what it can be, but uh, <clears throat> anyway. So now let me just, maybe I should hurry up a little bit because I want to do the, yeah, so this is, how much time do I still have? Okay, so. <laughs> but, <laughs> so anyway, so let me try to kind of convince you this model is integrable and then one can compute correlation, uh, well, uh, conserved quantities uh, and maybe Eric's of correlation functions. So now on top of uh, the map, now you have to discuss uh, the Poisson bracket or the measure. So there is a natural Poisson bracket on this uh, space of matrices, uh, which is given in this, M1, so M1 is the local space. On M1, this can be compactly written like this. And then it can be extended to ML, which is the, 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 the Cartesian product, simply by, 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 by asking this variable to Poisson commute if they are uh, uh, on non-identical spaces. Uh, and then of course you can define Poisson bracket of any function of multi, 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 multi variable function of these matrix variables through that. And then there is a nice uh, 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 kind of 
so that it would be like the infinite temperature Gibbs measure, if you want, which is invariant with respect to these dynamics, or measure, if you want, for, or, or, or I don't know, you will measure, no, you will measure, let's say, uh, an analog of you will measure, which in these affine coordinates, which you can always define for these Grassmannians, uh, would be written just like that. <laughs> so now, uh, the claim is then that map M2, so the map, the two body map is symplectic over M2. And the full many body map then defines symplectic dynamics over ML. And the full many body map preserves the above Poisson bracket. <laughs> and this infinite temperature measure or maximum entropy measure, of course, is uh, consequently invariant at the, the full many body map. So now we have basically show that this is an integrable dynamical system with, uh, with, with, with a phase space, with the dynamics, and, and the measure, <clears throat> invariant measure. And uh, okay, so now, yeah, maybe I already showed that this model is completely integrable, but I will show it also through the definition of the transfer matrix. So let's now define a monodromy matrix, which would be, in case, would be a matrix uh, in uh, a matrix, which would uh, be also a function of matrix variables, which, which is a, a product a string of product, a, a product of Lux operator at different sites. And which other each other spectral parameter is it is a standard spectral parameter. So it's lambda, lambda plus tau, lambda, lambda plus tau. Right. So you see that tau is the, the difference of spectral parameters on the two on the two things. I mean, this was like already before when I derived the map, but now this already tells me immediately that the trace of the transfer operator, the trace of the monodromy matrix, which is a function, I would like to call it a transfer matrix, but since it's not a matrix, it's a function. Of L, of L matrix variables and the spectral parameter. So I rather call it a transfer map. So this transfer map now is uh, commuting, well, it is preserved under the full many body dynamics and it is in evolution for various arbitrary pair of spectral parameters. So for me, this is kind of the most clean proof of integrability of these dynamics. <clears throat> and then, of course, you can define um, logarithmic derivatives of this beast and you show you can show that these guys are local conservation laws but only under the condition that Grassmannians have rank one this is another interesting feature which needs probably some attention and discussion uh namely if the rank of this Grassmannian is not one then you cannot find these points in which lax operator becomes a pure projector and these are needed in order to show locality of the conservation laws right and there is this 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 trick which i learned from for the F. Taktajan book, for example, uh, where you know you can show, I mean, this is like how you show that the, the, the conserved quantities should be local. And for that, you need that special value of spectral parameter where the Lux operator becomes a projector. Here is a projector only for K1 Grassmannians. Otherwise, this, these operators are not local, but they might be quasi local in the sense that we discussed in, in quantum spin chains. But <clears throat> this is something that is totally open at the moment. Okay, now let me try to show you, yeah. This is trace. Well, and the point is now the auxiliary space and the, the, the again, this model is a kind of, uh, how you would call this in, in algebraic analysis, this model is like fundamental model, right? It, the, the auxiliary space is the same as quant not quantum, but phase space. Tau big is a number. Yes. It's just a number, but it's dynamical variables, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, what do you mean n minus m? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Or n minus one, exactly, yes, thank you. That's of course go without saying. Thank you. <laughs> now let me just uh, now give you some limits of these models because these models might sound kind of a bit uh, abstract. So let me now take some Hamiltonian limits to show you that you get some models that maybe you know of. For example, if you take now, okay, now I will write, uh, also I will allow for twists, which I will write as e to the minus uh, i tau times some b, uh, and they will let limit t tau to infinity. So I'll take the Hamiltonian limit and then uh, these dynamics can be shown to correspond to Hamiltonian dynamics with the lattice Landau Lipschitz SUN or, or non, I mean, higher spin, well, not higher spin, but you know, you know what I mean. 
uh, generalized lambda Lipschitz models on the lattice, right? So this would be the Hamiltonian. I mean, this is the interaction, and this is the uh, the magnetic field term, the linear term. Now, if you do on top of that, also the continuous space limit, if you think of these matrices uh, to be replaced by a matrix field with some lattice spacing delta, then you take also on top of that, after taking the Hamiltonian limit, you take the limit delta to zero, then you get the field theory, Grassmannian field theory uh, with this type of Hamiltonian density, again, which should be integrable. Again, all this reduces to landau lifshitz model where M is two by two, which can be written as a Pauli vector times uh, a sphere, a vector on a sphere, right? And then it becomes just a standard uh, landau lipschitz field theory for this vector field, <clears throat> normalized vector field. Okay, now uh, this also reduces to a nice model uh, for discrete space-time model for n equal to two k equal to one, which actually can be written independently, can be written in terms of SO3 invariant operations, like you have two unit vectors on a sphere and the map uh, brings you to, I mean, this maps gives you a, a pair of other uh, unit vectors, which are only written in terms of dot, product, dot products and cross, cross products. This again has been known, this has been proposed before by Giga and me. Uh, and the point of that paper was to generalize that model. I mean, this model again then reduces in the continuum limit to lattice non model. Yeah. Yes, it turns out to be kind of Right, right. Yes, yes, I will mention this, and this was actually the work later with, in collaboration with Vincent, but uh, I will just go to that in a, in a second, right? So now let me just show now, this will be like two slides of numerics. Now we've, we've stopped doing mathematical physics. Now we go back doing computational physics and numerics and uh, just you know computing correlation functions of this class of models for different Lie group symmetries. This is SU2 rank one, SU3 rank one, SU4 rank one, SU4 rank two. SU5 rank one, SU5 rank two. The correlation functions are kind of indistinguishable. And if you look at correlation functions at x equal to zero, they should decay with dynamical exponent alpha, where alpha is one over z. They basically decay with the same exponent. And this exponent is basically perfectly two over three. So it's just experiment to show that these models have the same sort of phenomenology. <clears throat> and then it's two point functions, again, compared with prachofer spohn you find excellent agreement again for this, uh, uh, these models. And if you want, you include mag this magnetic field provides some sort of oscillations, or precession if you want, of the spin. Uh, this frequency in which these correlation functions that oscillate depends on the strength of magnetic field. Now this is again, this is just, now let me go to the second part of my talk, uh, discussing fluctuations. So I still have to be careful how am I doing with time. So I can safely take 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so now, now the, about the question you asked. I mean, uh, also now let me discuss fluctuations. That is what we are discussing now. But we are going beyond SU two. Uh, SU two symmetric model. We will try to produce also anisotropic deformation. So we go from x x x to x z, uh, uniaxially uh, symmetric u uh, one symmetric uh, uh, spin models. Uh, Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so again, I, I will be using an unbiased infinite temperature equilibrium state, and we will compute uh, distribution of fluctuations of the current. So, so far, we have been looking at the slightly non equilibrium state, and we have been computing uh, either two point functions of the current or uh, in slightly non equilibrium states that it was in equilibrium, but in slightly non equilibrium states, we were computing uh, correlation functions, functions of the current. Now we'll look at fluctuations, that is arbitrary endpoint functions, if you want cumulants or the full moment generating functions or probability distribution functions of the integrated currents. So the idea is now let's take the system. This is favorite uh, large deviation slash full count setup or not, because you, know, you might want to consider finite system steady state or uh, uh, any sort of setup. But in our setup, we, the large system, infinite system, finite time, we look at uh, the current which flows through the system in finite, through the some point. Now, as you have seen in these models, it has been this correlation function which sits at the origin. So this is traditionally referred to as a heat peak. So there is no motion uh, at x equal to zero. So it's natural to look at x equal to zero, right? 
and uh, integrate the current through this point. <coughs> and we look at the distribution, look at the, all the cumulants of, of the integrated current, find the dynamical exponent. Now we look at the equilibrium. So the first moment is, should be zero. And the second moment, again, should define dynamical exponent for the spinning. And then we look at, the, then we scale the current with the root mean square. Uh, that is the square root of the second moment. And we define the scaled current. And this scaled current should have well-defined probability distribution, right? If, at least in the typical time scales. Then we compute it, for example, or the, its full distribution. So this is sort of the problem. And now this is some numerics. Again, this problem, again, this is pure numerics. We cannot say much, but I want to stress that now that, uh, uh, as you asked, uh, uh, we need to also de de define the dynamics, which is very similar to the dynamics I've showed. This one, well, it's not very similar, it's more complicated, but it's natural deformation of these dynamics. So I'll just, sorry for going back a bit. Uh, we start from these dynamics, which is SO3 symmetric. And now we ask whether we can do uh, kind of deformation, a Q deformation, if you want. And this was a, 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 a nice trick that was proposed by Vanson. Uh, which we kind of then uh, developed further and uh, pro provided also uh, simulations of of, of two-point functions uh, with giga and na. It's a classical Q deformation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, I, this should have been talked on its own how to discuss this model, but I'm just giving you the reference here. I'm not having time to go to that. It's just a nice model to basically, again, why is nice? Because you can do super efficient numerical simulations because time step could be one. And again, you expect the same sort of physics. So now these are three different cases. This is delta la less than one, delta zero, delta one, delta larger than one. This is e e XY-like, Heisenberg-like, uh, X uh, easing like uh, And you see dynamical exponent, which you have to use in order to provide full distribution of typical fluctuations. So now this is uh, dynamic exponent one, this is ballistic. So this should be something that uh, basically be described by the theory that was discussed yesterday by Takato. Uh, on the ballistic scale, there should be a GHD, uh, basically uh, uh, approach to large, uh, fluctu to, to large deviations, which should, should work well here. But now if you go to sub-ballistic scales that we expect, we expect for example, for uh, z equal two in the diffusive case, we find the distribution is manifestly different from a Gaussian. And actually I don't have much time to discuss. Maybe I will, at the end of my talk, I will go back a little bit to that, but this is actually a funny distribution. And uh, you might wonder whether this is some universal distribution or not. And actually I can discuss this in private better because it's probably beyond the time frame of my talk, but it's a very interesting question. But now looking at this distribution, this is something that corresponds to a topic point, which looks like a Gaussian. Now, if you look at its moments, that is, it's, 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 it's actually its cumulants, then this cumulants you see uh, in the isotropic point seems to scale at log t. So well, this means that this cannot be really a Gaussian. Or, oh, no, no, sorry, this is for z equal to two. For z equal to three over two, it goes to zero, but there are other things that we can discuss. Okay, now probably I should not go into too much uh, detail of this because we are still, as you see, rather confused about different interpretations of the results, but uh, certainly the, 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 what is kind of remarkable is that the distribution of fluctuation is not what people would expect and find for models which have KPZ uh, uh, universality, which have KPZ two-point functions. For example, there has been this study of Mendel and Spohn of unharmonic oscillator chains where they find, again, uh, KPZ uh, uh, sound peaks, they found KPZ two-point functions, but not for the hit peaks, but for the sound peaks. There is pieces of two-point functions which move at constant speeds away from the origin. And if you subtract the speed of the peaks and you look at the distribution of the integrated current through that point which moves with the peaks, then you get what people expected, which is the bake range distribution. And bake range distribution is manifested. These are the two distributions. And this is the heat peak, and the heat peak should be Gaussian. So the bake range are you know, these distributions which are clearly asymmetric. But in our case, what we find something which is clearly symmetric, which is due to the fact that equilibrium. So it's something that, I mean, this is really one puzzle. We cannot, don't understand why we can have something, well, we cannot have something like a bake range because we are at equilibrium. So uh, the question is, what do we see? 
I mean, this is like something which is partly in KPZ universality class, but it cannot be totally KPZ because it's equilibrium physics. So it's, you know, uh, it's, it, needs, it needs sort of clarification. But now let me go move on and let, get, let me go to the last part. Okay, so let me just give you a slide on scaled cumulants. Now, if you look at scaled cumulants, that is another interesting thing, which is puzzling. Then, you know, the scaled cumulant should be given what people know as scaled cumulant generating function. So if you know the dynamic response, something counting for lambda, if you do this, this is like a partition sum of some sort. You define a logarithm of that, you divide by t to the one over z, and this is the limit t to infinity is moment generating function. It's a scaled cumulant, cumulant generating function. Now, in general, well, in general, in models which are behaving nicely, these uh, derivatives of this beast at lambda equal to zero give you the scaled cumulants, but not in our models. It turns out that in models that we discuss here, these scaled cumulants typically don't exist, they diverge. Ne nevertheless, the scaled cumulant, cumulant generating function, which is also given in terms of the Legendre transform of the uh, rate function through large deviation principle, this guy exists. So even though this guy exists, there is, a, there is no problem which would allow you to exchange the limit t to infinity and lambda to zero, the derivative lambda to zero. So it's a rather innocent analysis, which somehow people don't discuss in physics literature because everything works there in Markovian systems. Now in deterministic systems, seems to nothing, I mean, in integrable deterministic systems, this is generically broken. So basically scaled cumulants which diverge, which can be a to kind of criticality in time if you want but again there's no time to discuss that i think yeah no i still have time but so now let me just again there is this issue of how the scaled cumulants behave so these are scaled cumulants sorry for this this should be s these are scaled cumulants again for the model uh three over two so this isotropic model the fourth cumulant seems to be behaving nicely but the sixth cumulant seems to be diverging is diverging is rather small so this plot looks like kind of nice. This plot looks kind of quite Gaussian, but the tails uh, hide some surprises which are hidden in six cumulants. Uh, yeah, almost bizarre, yeah. <clears throat> okay, now I think I'll have to skip maybe some piece of it. I mean, that is maybe a little, uh, well, I can just go quickly into that, but you know, this is kind of related. This plot has been produced uh, in discussion with experimentalists, Emmanuel Bloch and his, his company, because they were measuring this. I mean, they were actually measuring non-equilibrium, well, not full counting, but they were counting number of atoms which were in time t. So they were looking at the first moment, or well, they also look at the distribution. So you might say they looked at full counting, but but you know the question is how much you can uh, trust this, or I mean, at least at finite time, is this finite time? So how much you can deduce from finite time experiments. But anyway, so what we kind of looked at was also the same model, but we looked at now uh, as a function of the, this integral. So this mu is the, and as a top, uh, well, sorry, is, is a quench parameter. So look at the initial state, which is a, a partial domain wall. And this mu different from zero means that you are away from equilibrium. So this is a non-equilibrium non parameter and this is dynamical exponent, non-equilibrium dynamical exponent which goes from 1.5 to two, which we drifts to two when you, break, uh, with, when you break equilibrium. So it's just to show that when you go to non-equilibrium protocol, you break also SU2 symmetry. So our conjecture was you need SU2 symmetry plus integrability to see KPZ uh, two point functions. So if you break SU2 with initial state, then it seems that correlation functions drift. I mean, the dynamic response three drift to diffusion, but very, very slowly. I mean, these are very, very long times. These are times, you know, what they can do in experiments, they can basically feel times the order of 100. Basically, they are here and they are happy with what they see. But if you go to very long times, you see something which drifts towards two. So, which again, yeah, to us is not surprising, but one has to understand it at some point. Now, let me just go in the last piece of my talk, last five minutes, to something that we can understand. So now let's do a model which we can solve completely. And, uh, which explains a little bit of that physics that we have seen. So that model is a uh, deterministic uh, cellular automaton. Again, all these models I'm talking about here are deterministic models, no stochastic elements. 
There is stochasticity in the initial state because we take maximum entropy initial state. So we propagate information from initial state to dynamics. So now this model is the following. It has uh, two, it has three sides, three, three sort of uh, three, three, three states per site. There is a vacancy and there is a plus and there is a minus. So there's a particle of charge plus, particle of charge minus and a vacancy. When the two vacancies meet, nothing happens. It's just the empty space. When the particle meets the vacancy, it goes through. So particle moves freely. But then when two particles meet and they have different charge, they reflect. So these are like impenetrable charges. They move deterministically. As long as they meet, then they reflect. So if you want, it's a kind of a single file deterministic dynamics. Particles cannot cross. Uh, they are charged. And now you take the infinite kind of maximum entropy state, which has well defined density of plus, which is one plus B over two times rho, one well defined density of minus one minus B over two times rho and density of zeros, which is one minus rho. So when B is zero, the density of plus is equal to density of minus. So we call B a bias. So when bias is zero, there is equilibrium. Well, there is equal density of plus and minus half field system. But then there is density of vacancies, which is one minus rho. And vacancies are needed to provide transport. If there is no vacancies, this plus and minus are stuck and they cannot go. So you need vacancies to allow for transport. So it's really a very simple model. And you probably should not be very surprised that this model can be solved exactly. <clears throat> so I have no to go through the methods, but the methods are really simple. I mean, you see, you just there for a few days. I mean, this is like one diagram, which would be enough if I had an extra 10 minutes to explain you why we have this moment generating function. But this is like, a, if you want, it's like a revised model of moment moments in time, I mean, of, of dynamics in time, uh, which so that this moment generating function is like a partition sum of a, of a slightly more complicated model than a revised model uh, in time. Now, the size of the, this is like spins, but uh, uh, in size t and uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, but maybe I go back slide. So you see what you have basically is you have plus particles, which are red, minus particles, which are blue. And this, this, uh, this uh, uh, emphasized lines are those lines which go from one half to the other half. So when you go, when you integrate the current through this section, you only look at the lines, word lines, if you want, which go from one half to the other half. And this number of word lines, which go from one half to the other half is basically the number of vacancies on the left, which go left, minus number of vacancies on the right, which go right. So it's basically each, the only time that the word line can move is when it meets a vacancy. So it's very easy to, 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 to count how many lines word lines can move through the section just by looking at the number of vacancies. And then once you have that, then it's just kind of a simple one, the easing partition function because it's just pluses and minuses which are coming with some probabilities which are well defined. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, Forgive me for not going into the details, but you know it's really kind of a, almost a textbook, I mean, almost a textbook or model which can really solve. So then the 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 partition sum is totally explicit, and then you do an asymptotics on this partition sum. So now this partition sum is written as a two twofold binomial sum, and this mu plus mu minus is written here in terms of the counting field and and the bias. And then from that you get the scaled cumulants. Uh, now these are the normal cumulants. Well, this is divergence of normal cumulants, but also scale cumulants diverge because all the higher cumulants go with different powers of T. So even the scaled cumulants, which are one over T times this scale for large enough N. And then from, from that we derive uh, probability, dense, uh, uh, probability distribution, distribution functions of typical fluctuations, which are Gaussian for typical case and which are specific, have specific feature uh, which actually, this is actually written in terms of, this can be written in terms of the Laplace, inverse Laplace transform Kleffler function. Um, and it's sometimes called the white function, but it's also written in terms of this simple integral. So this is this function, which has a cusp. So this is the distribution of the integrated current for symmetric case, maximum entropy case, B equal to zero, uh, which has a cusp at J equal to zero. And now I'm just giving you as a teaser. I mean, this is actually interestingly related to this distribution. Uh, to this distribution for the Landau Schitt's model. I, I, if you know how, ask me. <clears throat> so with this, I would like to conclude. 
so yeah, there is a couple of conjectures which you see. I mean, there's very little things which are very little results in this talk, but there has been many observations and many conjectures. One sort of very general conjecture is that uh, integrable systems with non-abelian symmetries uh, should exhibit superdiffusion of nether charges with dynamic exponent three over two. This, this goes in classical and quantum integrable systems, but classical integrable systems are really Liouville really integrable systems. They are not integrable systems like ASEP. ASEP is for me not an integrable system. Uh, one has to you know, be a deterministic integrable system, yeah? Otherwise, you cannot. <laughs> and second conjecture is fluctuations in integrable systems on subalistic scales are anomalous. <laughs> we have abundance of numerical proofs and some simple exactly solved model, but we need general proofs. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Proofs? That will be answers. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Just, just please. Uh, so just to clarify, because yesterday it was a talk by Takato, and it was like uh, this uh, general large deviation theorem. There he had Z only one, right? Yes. Yes. And this, and but it seemed very general. So, 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 so now only because of this non-abelian symmetries, it's yes. Well, it's enough also to have Z two symmetry. It doesn't have to be non-abelian. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I see. For example, this last spatial automaton has just a Z two symmetry. It's not a non-abelian. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you need to have. Well, you need to have some balance of, you need to have at least D2 symmetry and balance of charges. So in the balance sector, uh, you can have sub-ballistic transport in maximum entropy state. Mm. And then you need another kind of insight. Yeah, which mm. don't have. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's start with you. Oh, so I'm just wondering, did you also check other models like uh, Fermi Hubbard model? If they could exhibit um, anomalous uh, cumulant behaviors, or do you expect any other models to behave in the same way as in the? As for the cumulants, no. Uh, as for this three over, two, as for the dynamic exponent, yeah, I think it's numerics, maybe even published. I don't, I forget now, but from mm -hmm. for by Christoph Karash, which is uh, consistent uh, with the claims, also for Hubbard, but not for the fluctuations. No. Okay, thank you. To verify. Yeah, in, in the ballistic case, it's known that you can have uh, diverging cumulants, and yet, like f of lambda that exists when you have a zero velocity mode. Right. And in integrable systems, of course, you have a lot of well, you have a lot of modes including zero velocity, but it's very typically not very much supported, like so d theta or something like that. So, do you have? I mean, you think about that. Maybe you have some other, you know, hydrodynamic modes that are zero velocity that create Here. this anomalous thing. Uh, Heat mode, I mean, there is no sound modes, no mode, no, but uh, again, this is at symmetric uh, sector. So, no, I don't know. I mean, uh, like there is this rule 54, for example, which is uh, very much like a generic integrable system, like when you have two sound modes, modes no, no heat mode. Mm -hmm. And there, I expect everything should be normal as you, as you expect for the yeah. sound modes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but the, but the heat mode is a zero velocity mode essentially. So that's yeah. yeah. Any further questions? If not, let's speak up. Thank you, speak. And resume at two thirty.